Thank you for coming, and uh, yeah, take it away. Thank you. Um, probably another follow-up question. Um, who is um, upstream committer to uh, Kubernetes code base? One. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so what I'm going to talk about is basically um, also written in blog posts. So this is currently some, some topic around Kubernetes that, that I'm um, um, yeah, playing with and trying to push forward um, um, as, as a side project in the end. Um, Cobite um, is a software storage uh, vendor. We built a what we call data center file system, which is a, uh, a parallel file system that can do high performance, high performance block storage, object storage. Um, as a basically in a full tolerant scalable uh, fashion. Um, and so um, container infrastructure is obviously very important for us and uh, so we're all, always working on all sorts of integrations and uh, tr also trying to improve uh, state of the art here. Um, and uh, one issue that we identified and others have also identified is uh, a se secure access basically with access control is, is a big problem uh, still unsolved. Um, and this is currently something that, that we've been working on uh, in, the, in the last months uh, to, to get to a better state. But it's not yet something that's uh, being um, solved in a, in, a, in a wide range um, in the container infrastructures. So, um, yeah, to worry about myself. Um, so I'm um, one of the founders of uh, Cobite. Um, yeah. Also worked on kernel stuff, um, microkernel stuff uh, during, during, at the university. Um, then, um, here in Berlin at Sins Institute, uh, EU project, uh, the Extreme FS parallel file system. Uh, then I uh, went to Google for a couple of years, uh, the storage infrastructure, now uh, doing, um, at Cobite, writing a software product, uh, the classical way, no services, nothing. Um, this is the agenda for the talk. Um, so I'm going to do a review basically on the mechanics of storage access. Basically, how does it work um, under the hood? Uh, because it, it's not very complicated, but there are a few mechanisms um, that, that are important um, and then to, to understand the whole problem and uh, where we are. Um, then I, I'm going to describe uh, the, the problem of access control um, and then show how we solve that uh, with uh, the Cobalt Kubernetes uh, plugin, which is, um, I think, not yet upstream uh, this part uh, of the of the plugin, but generally in the, in, in the grand scheme of things, there's still a lot of uh, things to solve um, um, at, at Kubernetes or other uh, infrastructure level. Uh, so it's not only a storage problem, as so we will see. So a quick review on uh, containers. What are containers? In the end, uh, their core um, function is isolation. Um, they do that by two means, uh, namespaces. Uh, so everybody has, has an idea of what, what a namespace is? Okay, yeah. It's, it's an abstract concept, but um, abstract concept, but um, yeah. So the file system namespace, network namespaces, user group ID namespace, and so on and so forth. Um, and then we have resource isolation uh, through, through C groups, CPU, and, and so on and so forth. So the first important part uh, for storage access are uh, file system namespaces, obviously. Um, you all know that, but um, uh, we, we, we have basically the, um, I, I've been told not to um, get too far away from the speaker because it gets, um, but, but it works. Um, so we have the um, host uh, namespace, basically slash um, the, the directories, everything's running on a local file system like x4, xfs, uh, for example, right? Um, and then we have containers, um, each one with their own namespaces, it's, it's fully isolated per se. Um, the, the namespace is backed by overlayfs, and that's the Docker image uh, that you're seeing um, in, inside the container. Um, and then you can take parts of other namespaces and map them into uh, the container namespace, right? These are the two mechanisms. The first, it's, it's isolation, and then you have a mechanism to take parts of um, other sub-namespaces, basically, and put them in, into your container. Um, the second thing, which is relevant for um, access control, are uh, UID namespaces. Uh, basically, you have um, the, the normal UID as seen in ETC, PassVD, or from, from an SSSD provider via LDAP. Um, basically, username and then um, UID, like root and UID zero, and so on and so forth. Um, and then you have the same thing um, in their own namespace, right? So they are in a system uh, with a, which has a container, there are two root users, both have um, um, UID zero. Um, but as this thing is isolated, it's obviously not root in this um, um, namespace. Um, and so um, 
but um, in the end in this container there are processes running that act and do something and are just containerized processes and they um, basically act um, as I here with a mapped uh, UID. It doesn't need to be an ETC password so there's probably no username attached but in the end um, there's just um, these, these users that um, do something here have a, have a counterpart here that hasn't much, um, how to put it, um, there are no rights involved or anything, but um, they're obviously there uh, for the kernel. So, um, the, the goal that we want to achieve is uh, to get a persistent storage, um, and which options uh, do we have for that? Uh, the overlay FS is obviously not an option because when the container is going down, the data is gone, right? That's how it works. Um, then what we can do is um, map in a, a subdirectory of, of the host file system. And there are basically three um, options uh, for doing so. Uh, you can take local block devices. Uh, basically, that, that means something from the local hard drive of the host. Um, basically, a, um, which is X4, XFS, uh, some subdirectory, for example, home, Docker, I don't know, and then map it um, into, into the container. But that's then only stored on that host, and that's not the kind of computing we want to do uh, with Kubernetes because it's a distributed system. Um, the other option is um, taking um, a host file system that's uh, backed by a network uh, block device or taking a host file system backed by a network file system. Um, and the example that you can, um, the example with which you can visualize that is um, imagine a MySQL container. A MySQL um, has its state in var lib um, uh, MySQL and that's the subdirectory that we want to back by something durable. That's in the end uh, the whole goal of the, of the exercise. Can you, can you briefly mention the difference between network block device and network file system? Yes, yeah, so I have slides about oh, that now. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So network block storage. Um, what you do there is um, you, you have a, a, a blo lo network block device that's visible as a block device uh, via the driver uh, on the host machine. Uh, think, for example, a dev RDB zero, uh, if you have a, a Ceph running, uh, for example, or what you call it, X something on, on Amazon, the EBS volume. Th these are network block devices. They're not backed by local storage, but they're locally visible as a, as a block device. Um, what you need to do is uh, format them um, and then map them into, co into co the container. So what are the options there? Um, the standard protocol option um, are iSCSI uh, backed block devices, right? And there are a lot of storage systems for that. And uh, the more enterprise you go, the more likely it is that you have uh, something like that already in-house. Uh, then if you run on the public clouds, there's AWS um, EBS volumes um, as an option. Uh, Google uh, Cloud Engine has something similar. Uh, I think it's just called volumes or block volumes, I don't know. Um, this is the cloud version. And then basically on-premise, uh, you have probably an internal driver like uh, Ceph RBD or uh, what else is there? I don't know who has internal block. There's NBD, right? Um, <laughs> but uh, probably not, not many more. Um, there are a couple of problems with uh, using block storage this way. Um, first um, is the whole topic of failover, right? Um, you have a container running, block device attached, a file system mounted on one machine, and then you want to fail over the container to a different machine. What you need to do is uh, detach the block, so unmount the, ideally unmount um, the, the, the local file system, then detach the block device, attach it um, on the next machine, mount um, the, uh, the local file system again, and then probably if you didn't do a clean um, unmount FS check it. Um, there are a couple of things that can go wrong. The T detach attach um, is something that I, I've seen on, on, on Amazon going wrong um, every now and then. Um, then we heard um, if, if you have an OpenStack uh, cinder backed volume, that is also something that causes problems routinely. Um, and so, yeah, you can imagine that detaching storage, like unplugging a virtual but a hard drive, um, and then plugging it live in a different machine, that's, that's not, a, not a very robust um, kind of operation. <coughs> alternatively, alternatively, you can um, use network file storage. Uh, basically, what you can imagine there is NFS and SMB, everybody knows that, right? And then you don't have a local <coughs> block device, but you're talking a file system protocol of a network and not, not a block uh, protocol of the network. Um, I think in the public clouds, there's nothing available there. Um, I think Amazon has some NFS-backed things. 
but uh, file storage is not a um, big, or it's not one of the of the standard services there. Um, for the in-kernel part, um, there's um, a, a pretty strong interface in Linux. Uh, that's the Fuse um, uh, file system framework. Basically, it's a, it's a kernel module, a pipe, and then some user land um, a library that you can write um, file system drivers with. Um, and these can be drivers for network uh, file systems usually, but there's also things like SSH, FS, and, and things like that. So this is a pretty routine way uh, to do that. Um, but then there are also uh, uh, file systems that have internal drivers, like um, I think IBM's um, GPFS, um, Orange FS, and so on. There, there are quite a few um, with um, also um, internal file system drivers. The good thing about this, um, it enables a quick failover, right? Um, if, if you have a um, container running on one machine, it can access the same uh, data um, from all machines. You don't need to detach something and move it, but it's, it's just a file system, immediate file system um, access. And so the, the failover, um, there's nothing to do actually on the storage layer, it's just start a container somewhere else. And even better, it enables uh, concurrent access. You can access the same file system and data from uh, containers um, from, from many nodes, something which is not possible uh, for block storage backed um, uh, volumes. Um, network file storage um, adds an interesting um, uh, twist to the whole um, yeah, um, and namespace aspect. Because the problem is, um, on, um, if you assume you have, you have a network file system, want to run the, uh, the fuse uh, uh, driver or client there, uh, but usually you run it or have a core OS machine. Uh, the fuse uh, the client is nothing that you can install on that core OS machine, right? So the obvious solution is run it in a Docker container. Uh, and then it gets interesting with the, with the namespaces because in the end um, you, you have a um, yeah, driver that runs in a, in a container. Uh, so it's doing fuse here and then it's exporting, let's say, the, the network file system as slash cobyte. Uh, so everything's available under that. This needs to be uh, mapped into um, um, the host to, to slash cobyte. Um, so this is basically the, the infrastructure part. That this is pre pretty static. You have that on, on every machine. Um, and then dynamically for every container that wants to use that storage resource, you need to map a part of that into um, the, the state or stateful directory. Um, and this is something that, that works, um, but this not, I think probably for now a year or so, uh, this is nothing that has been, that the Linux kernel has been able to do for, for a long time. But yeah, that's, that's so kind of interesting, I thought. So, which brings me to the, the, the core topic of the talk, um, access control. Um, so I already said that um, we have the UID namespaces uh, for applications and then uh, applications that act as a specific UID in the container act as a completely different UID um, uh, down on the machine. Um, and this is actually not, not a bug, that's a feature, right? You, you want that kind of isolation. The problem is now that these UIDs are more or less random. Uh, so they uh, differ across time, right? If you start as a container twice, it doesn't have, need to have the same UID. Um, and it, um, they differ across uh, machines, right? So there's also no relation to that. And if, if you have a container that starts and starts and starts, um, then you, you always have different UIDs um, which operate on the file system. This is, I think, um, along the lines of what you described. So what can you do there? Um, the current state-of-the-art solution is um, um, basically make everything um, accessible for everyone, basically mod 7777, um, and then don't care about access control anymore. Um, and then the file is owned by the UID that happened to be the one mapped when the file was created. And that works, um, but it's not nice um, and uh, has a lot of restrictions, right? Um, the access control itself, then um, you can think of that as a volume level, right? Um, with a with Kubernetes, you, you take uh, vol these volumes and um, map them in, into a container, and um, you define what's being mapped. So it's not like every container can access all data, it can only access the volumes that, that, that are mapped. And this is kind of a volume access level control, but not file level access control. Um, and um, when you look um, into the file system, you have this, this mess of uh, permissions and, and ownership. Um, plus, you can take existing uh, volumes. Assume you have a NetApp filer with some, uh, some, some data. Um, you, you can just map that in and, and, and work on that data. 
So, um, what's, what's the situation? If you look into a um, MySQL container um, in the ETC pass 3 d um, or in basically any containerized application, stock containerized application, you really have the standard uh, users like root that maps to zero, uh, UID zero, um, and then you have some application user that um, the application and container acts with. Um, so in my SQL ETC pass 3 d it's 999 something. Um, if, if you if you think that through, um, I think you come to the conclusion that um, the user that acts inside the container is not actually the one that you're interested in acting, right? Um, if, if you have a larger inf infrastructure and run a couple of MySQL for different uh, um, users, um, different groups, different departments in the company, um, all these MySQL containers act internally as user MySQL, so the goal can't be to map that to user MySQL, right? Because then you don't have isolation either. Um, so, and I, I would claim that we can't, don't can't care about these container users at all. They're just an artifact of, um, of, of how containers run on, work on, on Linux, but they're not, not really relevant. So I think what we need um, is a, a taking the identity from the container platform, um, basically the, um, the Kubernetes, uh, that's the service account, um, and this is also in, in name, namespaces again, so there's another level of isolation. Um, and then map that um, service account um, to the file system, let that uh, be the acting entity. Um, and this is what, what I want to show you, um, um, how we did that uh, with, with Cobalt or sketch that quickly. Um, as I said, there's something that we implemented, it works, but it's not nothing that um, is yet upstream because there's a lot of, um, I, I have the impression, um, it would be interesting to get some feedback on that, that um, um, basically, the Kubernetes architectures, architects don't take uh, strong positions yet on things like um, identity and so on and so forth. It's nothing that, that there's a very strong identity concept with roles and access control and everything figured out and defined, but it's, it's this framework on which you can build uh, your infrastructures on. So I already talked about Cobalt, it's a file system. We, we do have a Fuse client and we have these uh, plugins, among them are the one for uh, Kubernetes. Um, and so in, in, in Cobalt, um, it's, it's a native file system, so we have um, actually uh, users and groups, uh, so we know that concept, so this is something that, that can be readily used. Uh, but we also have a tenant concept. So um, in, in Cobalt, you can have, you have file system volumes and they, they can belong to tenants and they're completely isolated by doing that. And also the users and groups are isolated. Um, and this is something that um, I think maps nicely um, to, to the Kubernetes concepts. We can take, basically take a Kubernetes namespace um, and make it a one-to-one -one relation uh, to, to Cobalt tenants and have isolation at this level. Um, and then you have the Kubernetes uh, service accounts and can map, can, you can map that or make that a, a relationship to the POSIX users. Um, if you do that, uh, the result is that um, the service account name becomes the acting entity. Um, and then if, a, if you run a MySQL container as um, application something, um, then it, and it, it creates files, the owner of these files is application something, right? And then, um, the other way around, you can create uh, files um, and give, give them ACLs or permissions that, that specific applications um, uh, can, can access the data. And by that, you have file level access control and no longer uh, volume access control. So how does that work? Um, that's a broad sketch um, because there's a lot of um, tweaks involved. <laughs> uh, because in the end, um, the, the, the problem that you have is that um, when you have a fuse driver, um, you, you're getting um, calls like open, close, uh, rename, and so on and so forth, right? Um, and these, um, the ones that you're getting um, are um, associated with the mapped UID um, of, the, of the process um, that, that it's coming from. So this UID is um, no longer a, a really strong uh, thing that you, that, you, that you can use. Uh, so what we basically did is um, creating, uh, yeah, mappings that are pinned to specific um, uh, tenants, users, and groups, and use these um, and map them into the container, and then all access that come via this path uh, can be then mapped to the right service account. Um, and so this is something that works nicely. Um, I'm not sure if, the, if that's the future yet, but I, I think um, in the current environment, there's no alternative. I think I've read that in your 
that, that in the current community they're also discussing now that, that you can tweak um, the, the I.O. path in a way that um, um, mappings like that are possible, but um, hardly um, there, there's no, no other way um, to do that. Yeah. Yeah, so th this is uh, basically the state of um, the art. Um, I, I, I hope you, you got an idea of the um, file system namespaces, UID namespaces, that there's a real problem with access control. Um, and then um, th there's a way to solve it. Um, but first, community needs to agree that who that thing is that acts on, 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 on storage. And I'd say in Kubernetes, it's uh, the service account and um, inside the namespaces. But I, I think there's no um, consensus on that yet. But if there's consensus what this identity is, then, then you can create mechanisms to establish that mapping. And then you're getting file level access control instead of uh, access control. Yeah, so much for storage um, in a nutshell. Um, do you have questions? <laughs> uh, yeah, just a quick addition for cloud file storage. Uh, I know that in Azure you have uh, SMB file storage across VMs. Mm -hmm. Do you think that uh, it could also be a Docker problem uh, side of things to implement? But just as you mount host volumes to container volumes, you could sort of uh, create a mapping between host users and uh, users inside of the container to try to manage this kind of access control. Um, let me think. Repeat. Pardon? You repeat the question. <laughs> repeat the question. Yeah, so there was first a remark that um, um, in, in Azure uh, we have SMB um, as a protocol available. Um, so this is um, a nice option there, I guess, for, for file system access control. Um, and then um, there was a suggestion that um, alternatively to create a mapping on the, on the driver level, you could probably um, uh, teach uh, Docker um, to, to get a notion of that problem and then uh, do the mapping. Um, Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm actually not sure. That, so there, there are a couple of um, aspects to that. If you, if you basically, um, so, so Docker is not doing anything, right, in, in the container. It's, it's just orchestrating, in some sense, uh, the kernel mechanisms. Um, and uh, the first thing it would need to do is to be able to, to, to create that user um, on, on to the bottom, right? Say, okay, there's now a user UID 5 allocated, um, and that's user something, service account name. Um, and then uh, um, upwards, it would need to. There would be a, it would need a notion of whatever this identity is, right? And it um, and get that from from above somewhere. But I think it could pipe that through. Yeah, that would be possible. That actually reminds me of these grid map files, right? And grid computing, which was the thing ten years ago, um, and they did, I think, stuff like that. Um, there was a, the problem they had to solve is like you, you have compute clusters. Um, and then you schedule jobs of users that are not part of that uh, your organization, um, and then they have all sorts of come with all sorts of users and groups and things like that. And you would dynamically uh, create that. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then actually, it might be possible. Yeah, yeah. It's a bit of a question in a question. Uh, are you familiar with the, uh, this project called um, IAM to Q, which essentially allows? Specific and QE specific allows assigning AWS to the credentials profiles and then writes to QE pods and namespaces. So you could essentially have uh, access to EBS volumes or specifically just from isolated namespaces. I mean, doesn't that kind of, to some extent, solve the, the locking down of specific sort of volumes to specific groups and namespaces? Um, so the question was, uh, there's a mechanism called I'm two cube yeah. um, uh, for 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 um, AWS that um, solves the sim or so tries to solve the same problem in a, in a different fashion. Um, so I'm actually not aware of it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I can can comment on, on that much. I, I I think it's it's possible to do it a different way as we just established, um, and, and so. Um, in the end, the important part is this, um, so that everybody sees, okay, this is a problem, then we, we get a notion of identity in Kubernetes that's actually allowed to be used uh, for, for, for this uh, use case, um, and then we can look how to implement it. And in the end, it's just establishing a mapping 
and that's in the end blue code, so it's not that complex. Again, right side, I don't know. <laughs> Please go ahead, yeah. Um, how's this solved uh, on Bark? How do you, does Google, what's the way Google uses it? Let me think. Are you allowed to talk about that? <laughs> um, the, 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 uh, the, there's no, uh, the, so the, you don't access the file system via the Linux file system namespace, but with a built-in client library. So the, and then you, you have a cluster-wide um, authentication and identity anyway. So they're not, they don't need to go, go through the kernel in the end. That's much simpler. So you, you're forgiven uh, uh, for access control and to know uh, the list of containers on their specific uh, UID mapping to be able to serve correctly? Um, yeah, the thing with uh, Quovite is that, uh, so the question is if, uh, if um, uh, basically you need some fixed notion of, um, of IDs uh, that are out there and to be able to do the mapping, right? Is that approximately? Uh, yes, I was wondering if you connect to the local API to know the list of containers. Uh, I know. So, so I, I think we are a bit of a, so we, we don't have that topic at all because uh, Cobalt internally, we're currently working with usernames and group names. Um, and so we can map um, whatever um, comes as an identity string from above directly to that. We don't need to go through a UID. Um, and so we don't care about UIDs at all once this mapping is established. And so we don't, I mean, we, um, uh, maybe, okay. So w where do we get uh, this identity from? Um, we're not getting that from Docker, but we get, get it uh, via the uh, Kubernetes volume plugin. Um, the Kubernetes volume plugin, when it starts a container, it establishes also, um, it, it calls the, the or, or the kubelet, when uh, starting the container, it calls uh, also the volume plugin to establish the mapping. Um, so it's a Docker level mapping in the end that, that does the I.O., right? But um, um, beforehand, um, uh, the plugin is called to do stuff like mounting, uh, attaching block storage and so on and so forth. In our case, it just does a little uh, string uh, transition, string operation, <coughs> which is pretty lightweight. But at that point um, um, in, in, the, in the workflow, we have access to the service account name of the uh, container. Um, so um, there's a basically map, probably, I, I don't know how it's called, map or so. Um, and then we can take the service account name uh, for the from the container and then uh, give that uh, to our fuse driver uh, to establish the mapping. So this uh, Docker is not involved at all. Yeah. Further questions? Yeah. Uh, I want to ask about the Cobalt uh, file system. If I would like to install it, how complex is this? How can I can I run it on my machines? Like to make cluster of this, or how does it work? Um, so, so first I have to say it's it's not open source. Um, uh, but you can download it uh, via our web page. There's a little registration form, and then you get, get direct access to the uh, package repositories and, and uh, Docker containers. Um, and then installing it um, is probably an hour at most, um, if you're familiar with the Linux command line, uh, maybe less. Um, or um, on, on our GitHub account, uh, there are uh, port files um, to install it um, as Docker containers on existing Kubernetes cluster. My main question was, do I run it on different machine and make cluster of all the storage I have around it? Does it support redundancy? This yeah, so this is, this is the goal in the end, like, um, like um, um, other distributed file systems as well, right? There, there are a handful from other ones like IBM GPFS to um, then also GlassDevS an open source part. Uh, so so Cobalt is in that, in the big picture um, like these. Um, it, it basically takes local storage um, as a resource uh, but then um, the, the storage service, the volumes above it, are completely decoupled from that. So there's no direct placement involved. Um, there's um, always redundancy, so we're doing uh, replication or register coding. Um, everything split, split brain safe via Paxos, uh, so you can unplug machines and everything. Um, and then you have the scalable cluster of storage where you can add machines uh, as you like and also unplug individual ones while it's running without service interruption. How does Cobalt uh, recover from uh, block corruption in a single, one single machine? Um, so we do end-to-end uh, um, -end checksums. 
um, on, on a block level or 4K level, uh, which are computed in a fused client and then checked along the path and written with the data. Um, and then when you read data and, and you see a corruption, then you're uh, repairing it from the replicas, or the, the, the replication mechanism is repairing that from, from one of the intact replicas. So there's nothing that you, you need to bother with. Does it take the whole uh, disk, like the flow device, or does it use a file system and mount it? Um, so, so Core works on, on top of local file system on X4 or XFS. <laughs> um, not with me, um, I think. Um, so uh, performance. Um, so we're always trying uh, to, to, to get to a hardware performance, right? But there's always, always a software overhead, a network overhead, and everything. Um, so we can get a low, as low as 100 microseconds uh, latency uh, for metadata operations and, and reads. Um, and, and so this is the level, the, the bottom basically, and then it depends on the hardware that you're using. If you have hard drives, it's, it's milliseconds, right? Um, if you have NV NVMe, then you can get actually in that direction. Uh, so one thing that's uh, special about Cobite is while it's a parallel file system at the core and can do a uh, very high throughput, right? Many gigabytes per second per machine. Um, it's also designed for um, random concurrent block I.O. And then you can do that with very low latency. Uh, plus something that we recently optimized for is uh, small file workloads. Um, this is stack SFS benchmark, uh, for example, uh, where you have uh, lots of uh, files, open files that you create and so on and so forth. A, a simple version of that is usually um, untarring the Linux kernel and building it. Um, and this is the kind of workload uh, you're, you're checking for. That. So, I can, so numbers depend on the hardware, but uh, we're, um, so we're, we're putting a lot, lot of effort into getting close to the hardware. Yeah. Another question. I, th I think the API is pretty stable, but they are adding new features, obviously. Um, so it's <coughs> in, in, in the end, um, so we have, it, it's, it's kind of an interesting situation because uh, we both have OpenStack support and Kubernetes support um, and com can compare the communities and um, how things are being done there uh, directly. Um, and so far, um, it's like night and day. Um, Maintaining, maintaining a Kubernetes driver is, is very easy because um, uh, you have this integrated, well-tested code base. Also, um, it helps that it's um, a strongly typed language, right? Uh, whereas OpenStack is uh, Python. Um, and um, so th th this is not, not a lot of effort. Um, currently, um, there's, there's an initiative to get better automatic testing, right? Um, running the storage system in a container and then testing the plugin basically end-to-end um, -end with the storage system. But uh, that obviously only works for software storage and not um, uh, for NetApps, um, uh, for example, that you need to have physically somewhere. Um, on the OpenStack side, everything is Python. Um, and then um, if you provide or if you basically want to have your uh, driver part be part of the code base, you need to run one of these uh, continuous integration infrastructures which are a lot of effort that break all the time and um, there are a lot of breaking changes and, and so on and so forth. So um, yeah, it's, uh, Kubernetes is great in this uh, respect. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, that uh, you use Paxos for, uh, for, for the Fortran and CD election. Yeah, so does it mean it's a standalone or does it require some connection to no, no, it's, um, we, we basically don't have third-party dependencies. I, I, it probably our Paxos implementation uh, that we took that uh, from our ExtremeFS uh, code base is probably older than Zookeeper even. Uh, so this is a yeah, pretty baked <laughs> Paxos implementation, pretty early one uh, too. So there's no Zookeeper and CD, uh, nothing. So we have all, our own database um, implementation and then also um, our own uh, replication mechanisms. Good. Further questions? No. Then thank you very much, and I think we can. <laughs>